To boost or not to boost? To mix or not to mix? And that is the question. Hi everyone, welcome and welcome back to Dr. Han's classroom. So now the FDA allows the use of mix and match booster dose, but they didn't tell us how to mix or how to choose. So today I'm going to present some facts from both CDC and other scientific articles to hopefully give you some evidence to help you make informed decisions. I want to make it clear that I'm not making a recommendation on which one you should get in this video. Instead, I highly encourage everyone to talk to their primary care provider to discuss your unique situation and need. So without further ado, let's get started. So what are the benefits of mixing boosters? Let's take a look at a few slides that were presented at the CDC ACIP meeting on Thursday, October 20th. The committee listed the evidence for how the Moderna booster given more than or equal to six months after the primary series can help prevent symptomatic laboratory confirmed COVID-19. Now the greater evidence level was at level four. According to the uh, footnote down there, it means very low evidence. Now both harm evidence for serious adverse events and reactogenicity are also listed at level four. This is largely due to the very small number of participants in the Moderna booster study. Likewise, the evidence for the Janssen, or also known as the Johnson & Johnson booster, given more than two months after the primary dose, is also rated at level 4. Same ratings for the Pfizer booster dose evidence. Now all these low rating is because of the low number or small number of participants in their respective studies. I made a video of the details of the booster studies last week. So if you want to look at the data specifically, you can check out that after watching this video. The link is in the description box down below. The biggest benefit data of mixing booster dose came from one study that looked at antibody level response. We have to keep in mind that this study has a relatively small number of participants. Now, In summary, the most benefit was for those with the primary Johnson & Johnson vaccine. A 100 microgram Moderna booster gave the greatest benefit, and the Pfizer booster also boosted the antibody levels quite a lot. After the primary Moderna series, getting the 100 microgram Moderna booster or the 30 microgram Pfizer booster give a pretty similar level of boost in antibodies. And after the primary Pfizer series, the Moderna booster gave the highest antibody levels, but getting the same Pfizer booster also increases the antibody to about 15 to 20 folds. And in fact, that was all the benefits we know for now from mixing vaccines. And there are actually quite a few uncertain benefits of mixing boosters. And let's look at it. Let's look at the first uncertainty. We currently do not know why the specific combination of Moderna vaccine after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine increases the antibody level the most. The higher mRNA dose in the Moderna vaccine could be the reason. And second, this lead to the second uncertainty, and we don't know how well the 50 microgram booster will work. The increase in antibody level could be less. The third uncertainty is that we don't know how long the increased antibody levels will last. Will we need another booster dose, the fourth dose, after another six months? Currently, we do not have that answer. And number four, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine seems to have a delayed reaction, and we don't know what kind of delay benefit from getting the Johnson & Johnson booster because the study duration was too short. Unfortunately, everything that I've just presented was based on one study only. We don't know the consistency of the data. Now, however, the officials often mention we need to stay ahead of the virus. So rather than being reactive and waiting for more studies, they currently act in a more proactive way to stay ahead of the game. And that is their argument. 
Now, after looking at the benefits, it would be unfair to not look at the risks of mixing boosters. The major risk of the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccine is myocarditis and pericarditis in young males, and the observed risk is higher among males under 40 years old. The CDC used the number from the various system to estimate the rate of myocarditis and pericarditis, and according to that data, the highest observed risk in adult males are between 18 to 24 years old, at about a little under 40 cases per 1 million doses. And Moderna appears to have a higher risk for myocarditis than Pfizer. Just very recently, Sweden, Norway, and Finland have all suspended the use of Moderna vaccine in people less than 18 years old. Again, the mRNA dose may be the reason, and we would hope that the half dose Moderna booster would decrease the risk of myocarditis and pericarditis. But the fact is, no one knows the answer for sure at this point. And I know a lot of you are going to say, "Hey, the numbers in the various systems are not realistic or are not reflective." Yes, many people criticize the number of the myocarditis and pericarditis numbers underreported in the various system, and we're going to take a deeper look at what is actually happening in the real world. And here we're looking at an article outside of the various system or the CDC official report. Now, this article published on October 6 in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at records obtained from the largest healthcare organization in Israel. The article concluded that the highest incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis cases were in 16 to 29 years old males at about 10.69 cases per 100,000 or about 107 per 1 million. So the Israel number suggests that the number reported in the various system may be underreported. And there is one more problem: the myocarditis or other serious side effect data were from the first two doses. And what about the booster dose side effect? Now we all know that all the booster dose trials were very small, with a very small number of participants, and it would be impossible to see rare side effect. Again, the only available data of booster dose side effects is from Israel. Now, their proactive surveillance system found 11 cases of myocarditis and pericarditis in 16 to 29 years old, after giving about a total of 368,000. 1,903 booster dose. Now, where did I come have that number? Actually, I just add those number in the red bracket. Now, this is about 30 cases per million dose of Pfizer booster dose. This number is lower than what we saw from getting the second dose. Now, however, these numbers are the best guess we can have right now. Unfortunately, none of the risk evidence is directly applicable for the Moderna booster dose, and we know there is a slight difference between the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. And more complicated factor is that now the Moderna has a half dose booster, and the really we don't have a good grasp. We hope, like I said, we hope the number would be lower. Now let's look at the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. The biggest risk for the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is thrombosis with thrombocytopenia or TTS. Again, the CDC relies quite heavily on data pulled from the various system. Now, there have been 47 cases of TTS reported in the various after the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. This is out of 15.3 million doses of Johnson and Johnson given to people in the U.S. only. Now, the highest occurrence of TTS is among females aged 30 to 49 years old, at about 10.2 cases per million. But that was quite different than what Johnson and Johnson reported to the FDA last week. They reported 73 total cases in the U.S. and 12 fatal reports. So there is a discrepancy seen in the various system again. 
So after looking at the individual benefit and risk, what about the potential public health benefit from booster by age groups? The CDC provided an estimation. Notice this is only an estimation of the number of people needed to vaccinate with a booster dose to prevent one hospitalization over six months. The graph showed for people over 30, it takes between a few hundred to three to four thousand doses of the booster dose to prevent one hospitalization. The benefit is quite clear for people over 65 years old. However, on the other hand, it will take close to about 12,000 doses of the Moderna booster to prevent one case of hospitalization in people between 18 to 29 years old. And so lastly, what are the ways to think through the question to boost or not to boost, to mix or not to mix? How do we solve this question? There are actually million possible unique situations and here I will give a few examples. Here the possible scenario one, a middle-aged woman who had the Johnson and Johnson primary vaccine. Now there is a small risk of TTS and myocarditis on the other hand is uncommon in females. So if she concerns about the TTS, then she may think about the mRNA booster dose from either Pfizer or Moderna. But if she is worried about the mRNA technology, which a lot of people are, then the small risk of TTS may outweigh her concerns and she could choose the same Johnson & Johnson as her boosted vaccine. Now let's look at possible scenario two, in elderly person, including both female and male. The risk for both myocarditis and TTS are very, very low for this group of people. So the CDC recommends people over 65 should get the booster. Certainly, we cannot ignore the fact that there are associated injection reactions and common vaccine side effects such as muscle pain, fatigue, fever, and because the rare side effect is very, very low risk. The choice between the boosters will have to depending on the availability of each brand of the vaccine. Now let's look at possible scenario three. This is perhaps one of the more complicated situation. A young male who had mRNA vaccine, either Pfizer or Moderna, if the young male is at risk for severe COVID-19 and if he wants the best antibody protections, then the highest level of protection from Moderna booster may outweigh the risk for myocarditis for this person. Now suppose the young male is at occupational risk but generally healthy. The consideration would be different. The risk for myocarditis may outweigh the benefit. Then in this situation, the Johnson & Johnson booster may offer greater benefits. And lastly, some of you may wonder what does fully vaccinated mean right now? As of the day I'm recording, the official definition from the CDC is still for people who have completed a primary vaccine series, either one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or two dose of the mRNA vaccine series, are considered fully vaccinated more than two weeks after completion of the primary series. But perhaps you may have heard in the news, the CDC director told the media on Friday, October 22nd, that the definition of fully vaccinated may be updated in the future because of the increased eligibility of the booster dose. In fact, that concerns me a lot. If or when this happened, it would take at least two to six months for people who have not received their primary series to get into the definition of fully vaccinated. Now, the concerns is even more or more complicated for recovered people who have natural immunity. And there are many studies I have already go over with you that additional booster dose may not offer much of a benefit for people with natural immunity. And you can check out another video that I produced a couple weeks ago. 
So I understand I have a very diverse group of people watching my videos and thank you for all of you that are watching and sticking with the channel and I respect everyone's individual choices. My goal is to provide both risk and benefits data for everyone so that you can make an evidence-based decision for yourself. Now if you find this video helpful, please give, leave me a comment, share and like this video. This channel needs your help to reach more people. Now next week, uh, the FDA will discuss the Pfizer vaccine use in children 5 to 11. If you have young children at home or know someone have young children, this topic will be very relevant to you and I'll be sure to cover this topic. Now that is all for this week and I'll see you in my next video. Thank you again for watching and Meanwhile, please stay safe and healthy. Bye.